Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Center for European Studies. Uh, welcome to our virtual world. Uh, we wish we could all be with you together in the uh, UNC Global Education Center Auditorium, but instead we're here via Zoom and we, are, we have a very special event this evening and we're very glad you could all join us. Tonight's speaker has been invited under the auspices of our Jean Monnet Center of Excellence as part of Professor Conrad Yarosh's European Alternative Research Project. I would like to thank the EU for their support, as well as our co-sponsors, the UNC Department of History, the Global Research Institute, the College of Arts and Sciences, and the Office of the Vice Provost for Global Affairs. I look forward to fielding your questions in a bit. Please put them in the chat box so we can get to as many as possible. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Vice Provost for Global Affairs, Barbara Stevenson, UNC's Chief Global Officer and a retired U.S. Ambassador. Ambassador Stevenson became the inaugural Vice Provost for Global Affairs and Chief Global Officer at UNC Chapel Hill in 2019. She leads UNC Global and advances a pan-university strategy to enhance Carolina's global reach, impact, and reputation. She's a fierce advocate for the role of higher education in constructively addressing complex global challenges and has extensive experience in collaborating across borders and societies. Previously, Ambassador Stevenson was president of the American Foreign Service Association from 2015 to 2019 and was a U.S. Foreign Service officer for over 30 years. As dean of the Leadership and Management School at the Foreign Service Institute, she launched the Culture of Leadership Roundtable to improve leadership across the State Department and U.S. embassies. In 2008, she was appointed U.S. Ambassador to Panama and later became the first woman to serve as Deputy Ambassador and Acting Ambassador at the U.S. Embassy in London. Other senior positions within the State Department include Deputy Senior Advisor to the Secretary and Deputy Coordinator for Iraq, Consul General in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and Consul General and Chief of Mission in Curaçao. Other assignments have included Special Assistant to Undersecretary for Political Affairs, Tom Pickering, covering European affairs, Desk Officer for the UK, Political Military Officer in South Africa, and Political Officer in The Hague, San Salvador, and Panama. She earned her PhD, MA, BA, and BA from the University of Florida in English Literature. We all at UNC are so glad to have you leading us in our global endeavors. Thank you so much, Barbara, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Katie. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight and always. Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining us for this really special evening. And as Katie said, I'm Barbara Stevenson. I'm Barbara Stevenson, Vice Provost for Global Affairs and Chief Global Officer here at Carolina. And I'm really pleased to be taking part in tonight's lecture by Roger Cohen, one of our nation's most experienced and distinguished journalists covering world affairs. Roger will be speaking on the future of Europe. And Roger, thank you so much for joining us. As Katie said, as Vice Provost, I lead you in these campus-wide global strategy and spearhead international engagement. Now, our programs, our, our global programs have shifted a bit since I arrived a year ago and a pandemic arrived six months ago, but our goal is still the same, to prepare the next generation of leaders to problem solve with peers and partners around the world. I'd like to thank Conrad Yarosh and the Center for European Studies for bringing Roger to our campus tonight. For more than 25 years, UNC's Center for European Studies, which I am proud to note is a Jean Monnet Center of Excellence by the European Union and was designated as that and as a National Resource Center by the US Department of Education, has supported countless academic conferences, visiting scholars, lectures, film series, and other events, and has developed an important outreach program that supports educators throughout our state at all levels, K through 12. The center collaborates regularly with the European Commission and the EU delegation to the US on initiatives and programming. The center's success is due in large part to outstanding leadership. I'd like to recognize John Stevens, the Gerhard E. Linsky Jr. Distinguished Professor of Political Science and Sociology. John is Director of the Center for European Studies. And Katie Lindner, who you already heard from, is Executive Director of the Center. Also, Rudy Colorado Mansfeld, Senior Associate Dean for Social Sciences and Global Programs in the College of Arts and Sciences. Rudy, who's gonna give closing remarks, oversees our area study centers and is my close partner. 
Thank you for all your work in providing us with unique and fascinating perspectives on the evolving nature of Europe. The Center for European Studies is a shining example of the great work our area study centers do to offer all Carolina students a first-rate global education. Professor Yarosh, in addition to being one of the Center for European Studies co-founders, has done a remarkable job of organizing the European Alternative Lecture Series. I've seen during my career in the State Department the changes in European affairs and US relations with Europe over the last few decades. I remember peaks of US-EU cooperation in the mid 1990s when, as Katie mentioned, I worked for one of the greats of American diplomacy, Tom Pickering, and also Stu Eisenstadt um, on building the architecture of that, uh, the transatlantic relationship. We've uh, had the pleasure of hosting both Stu Eisenstadt and Tom Pickering on our campus since I got here. They designed and built architecture that enabled nearly frictionless movement of goods and services between the US and the EU. They, they built, they made the concept of the West real and they made us a cohesive whole. However, and I will add editorially, in my view, sadly, we're in a new era, era, one that Roger Cohen has previously referred to in his writing as the great unraveling an era in which the United Kingdom has now officially begun its exit from the European Union. It's a world in which it's increasingly difficult to cooperate, to tackle mounting challenges that are uh, around the world. And meanwhile, we see right-wing populist movements emerge in many European countries, discouraging deepening European and global, global cooperation. And as if all that wasn't enough, a global pandemic has made it difficult in an unprecedented way to travel and come together and just convene and do the basic work of diplomacy. Roger has covered these shifts extensively and shed light on the complexities and nuances of these challenges. I've known Roger at least since we were both in London together in 2010-2013. We have mutual friends. That's about when this whole Brexit nightmare began to take shape in the back benches of the Tory party. One of my biggest regrets is that I didn't do more as an American diplomat to at least highlight early on what a terrible idea this was from the American perspective. Um, I admire Roger's work and I've been known to quote him in my own much less widely circulated columns. Roger has also been known to quote me. Roger emerged as a powerful voice on American diplomacy and why it matters. His piece in July 2017 on Rex Tillerson's leadership of the US Department of State is regarded by many Washington insiders as the tipping point, the piece of journalism that made it undeniably clear the sweeping, rapid, and perhaps irreversible damage Secretary of State, former Secretary of State Tillerson was doing to America's diplomatic capability. Roger is one of those rare journalists of great consequence. He also writes exquisitely from both the head and the heart. His piece on Brexit captures my sentiments in a way I could never muster on my own. It is utterly brilliant, and if you haven't read it, you must. I'm really looking forward to hearing Roger speak tonight on the future of Europe and what we should expect to see going forward. Before we hear from Roger though, I would like to introduce Professor Yarausch to say a few more words about his lecture series and tonight's speaker. Conrad Yarausch is the Lurcy Professor of European Civilization in the Department of History. He has written or edited over 40 books on modern Germany and European, German and European history. Most recently, he wrote Out of Ashes, A New History of Europe in the 20th Century, focusing on the theme, Taming Modernity. He has been concerned with the problem of interpreting 20th century German and European history, the learning processes after 1945, the issue of cultural democratization and the cultural history of the Cold War. He's been involved in discussions about quantitative methods in history, 
problems of postmodernism and questions of European memory culture, as well as the US-EU partnership. In addition to co-founding the UNC for Center for European Studies, he co-directed a new research institute on contemporary history in Potsdam, Germany. Under the auspices of the UNC Jean Monnet Center of Excellence, Yarosh is currently working on the book, The European Alternative, which will provide a historical look at how Europe's impressive post-war achievements and continuing strengths provide examples of attractive solutions for progressive politics and recover confidence in the ability of the European Union and the United States to meet common challenges. Now that's a book I look forward to reading. Professor Yarosh, thank you once again for your work in bringing such phenomenal speakers to campus to provide our students with thought provoking and diverse perspectives on Europe. I'd now like to hand this over to Professor Conrad Yarosh. Thank you very much, Barbara, for your personal words and especially Thank you, Roger Cohen. We are happy to welcome you to the University of North Carolina, at least online. Uh, usually, we are proud of our campus and we pick a time of the year in which everything blooms, but unfortunately, we were not able to do this this time. Let me just explain for a moment the purpose of the lecture, but try not to keep Roger from talking because that would be impossible and we would be missing pearls of wisdom. To reactionary populists in the UK and the US, Europe has become a dirty word. The right loves to bash the continent by charging it with creeping socialism and claiming that the EU is about to collapse so as to discredit the development of progressive politics. We have invited you to UNC because you are on record for attacking the hypocrisy of this anti-Europeanism and for setting the factual record straight to a larger public. And I completely agree with Barbara. One of your most brilliant op-ed pieces is a lament on Brexit called Requiem for a Dream. For a somewhat more academic audience, I have similarly been wrestling with the contemporary history of Europe during the dramatic swings of the last 30 years. My new book project begins in 1990 with the widespread optimism of the overthrow of communism that inaugurated the economic transformation of the East and the widening as well as deepening of the European Union. Then I address the very veritable avalanche of crises due to excessive indebtedness, mass migration from the Middle East and Africa, and the British withdrawal from the European Union that triggered widespread predictions of doom, especially in the conservative media. But these dire forecasts have failed to materialize since much of Europe remained economically competitive, protected by a functioning welfare state and willing to care for the environment. I conclude my reflection by pointing to shared challenges in defense, governance, and globalization that require a new transatlantic dialogue. For this topic, Roger Cohen is an ideal speaker. Since he is a prize-winning journalist, author, and public intellectual with a broad range of interests and a sharp pen. Born in London in 1955, he was educated at Oxford and has become a naturalized American citizen with experience of living as a foreign correspondent in France and 14 other countries. He is famous for his trenchant editorial columns in the New York Times, as well as for his several books on the Balkan Wars and other subjects, including a touching portrait of his mother's mental illness. We are relieved that he has just recovered from COVID-19, which has given him personal insight into the performance of healthcare systems on the continent and in the US, and I'm sure he would have been happy to miss that. Roger calls himself, quote, a European patriot in another one of his op-ed columns, since he is worried about the damage done to the United Kingdom and the US 
by right-wing populists like Johnson and Trump. Today, he is speaking to us about the future of Europe. He will be weighing continental problems, such as the EU's blockage in decision-making by insisting on unanimity against examples of progressive politics such as universal health care or child care. What must Europe do in order to live up to its own ideals of peace, democracy, and equality? How can the best instances of European practice serve as an inspiration for the renewal of progressive politics in the US and the UK? We are all looking forward to hearing your suggestive answers. Roger, it's yours. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much. Um, Katie and Conrad and Barbara. Um, it's a particular pleasure to see, or at least Z uh, remotely, as we all do these days. Um, Barbara, uh, again, she is, as she mentioned, an old friend and uh, one of the most remarkable diplomats I've met in the course of my last rather long career at this point. She is an exemplar of the honorable, dedicated, brave foreign service officers of the United States State Department, um, an institution that in my view has been treated with extraordinary contempt by President Trump and also by Secretary of State Pompeo. Um, I, we're meeting at an extraordinary moment and in an extraordinary way. Here we are in our rectangular Zoom boxes within the four walls of our two familiar homes, wondering a pathogen that yes, infected me, I don't recommend it, has made the world lonelier. I would have loved to be with you live and in person. In a few hours, President Trump and Joe Biden will confront each other in the first presidential debate. Perhaps 100 million Americans will be watching. Europe will be watching. The world will be watching. What will become of the United States? Unthinkable questions are being asked, the first of which is whether American democracy will survive. A republic, if you can keep it, said Benjamin Franklin when asked in 1787 what form of government had been adopted at the Constitutional Convention. His words feel particularly prescient in this turbulent fall. Europe needs no instruction in how democracies die. President Trump has done a lot to weaken post-war American bonds with Europe. These were forged in blood, let us never forget that. But the president is an ahistorical figure of limited curiosity. Perhaps he really thinks the American soldiers who fought and died for a free Europe were suckers. I don't know. What is clear is that he has lost no opportunity to undermine the European Union and NATO, the two organizations, as Barbara mentioned, that brought peace and unity to the continent. He is an America first nationalist. Post-war Europe was constructed around other ideas. Indeed, awareness of the dangers of nationalism, whose endpoint, as François Mitterrand observed, is war, undergirded the extraordinary work of Jean Monnet and Robert Schuman and Conrad Adenauer and George Marshall in building from the ashes a prosperous Europe dedicated to ever greater unity and a transatlantic community dedicated to safeguarding free societies. Borders gradually dissolved. Something new on the earth was imagined and put in place. Europe's rebirth was not a zero sum game. Europeans benefited, Americans too. Today, however, an American passport does not get you into Europe or vice versa. The virus has compounded estrangement. America the liberator has morphed into America the leper, or so it sometimes seems in Europe. American diplomacy as narcissism does not work, nor does American diplomacy as fact-free, 
values-free assertion. Diplomacy is patient work, easily undone. Witness President Trump's cavalier exit from the Paris Climate Accord. The French have a good word for that, la folie. I recently returned from a two month stay in Europe. The continent is reassessing its priorities in the light of President Trump's nationalist lurch. Emmanuel Macron, the French president, speaks of Europe's need for strategic autonomy. Angela Merkel, the German chancellor, who will depart next year and leave a big vacuum, I fear, has said, we Europeans truly have to take our fate into our own hands. Ursula von der Leyen, the EU commission and president, speaks of a geopolitical commission, one that will project European strategic thinking rather than bury itself in the bureaucratic minutiae of the union. Diplomats mutter that the re-election of Trump might mean that Europe has to focus on containment of the United States, the word coined by an American diplomat, George Kennan, to describe the policy he advocated toward the totalitarian Soviet Union. Think about that, ladies and gentlemen. If 1989 was the end of the post-war era, 2020 is the end of the post-post-war era. We have entered an era without a name. What is to come in, co in COVID-19 world is anybody's guess. What we do know is that the world is most dangerous in moments when the tectonic plates of the international system shift, every assumption is questioned and fracture grows. This is a challenging moment for the union to reimagine itself. Battered by Brexit, that terrible thing, divided by the illiberal turn of Hungary and Poland, besieged by a tenacious virus, dismayed by an America gone AWOL, Europe has no clear road ahead of it. Its options are what I would like to explore a little later in this talk this evening. But first, a few words about myself that may put what I say in context. Europe, you see, is personal to me. It's not a story. It's my life. Let me attempt to explain why. I am, despite what you've already heard, an optimist. South Africa, where my parents were born and I spent my infancy and some of the most formative moments of my childhood, leaves you with that. The inevitable cataclysm did not happen. The blacks did not rise up to avenge the crimes of apartheid and chase my family and four million other whites out. It did not happen because of leadership or even that quaint, almost forgotten word, statesmanship, Mandela's and de Klerk's. It did not happen because the promise of the future was placed above the wounds of the past. Coexistence, imperfect and in many ways unjust, prevailed over vengeance. Compromise is a one word that may save a million lives. I have learned that in my bones over the years and in several war zones. Because apartheid was intolerable to my father, I grew up mainly in Britain, a Britain for which the continent, as it was then called, was vaguely threatening, a place of garlic, rabies, Napoleonic law, and unhygienic habits, as well as the Germans who were always available as the butt of bad jokes. One of the great satisfactions of my life was watching this prejudice fall away, Britain take its place in Europe, gastronomy in England find an unlikely accommodation, and tolerance spread. Until, in 2016, Britain, in an extraordinary act of self-harm, hurled itself over the Brexit cliff, bigotry reasserted itself, and Boris Johnson bobbed up to reveal the inexhaustible English fascination with jolly good pranks and to heck with the consequences. The Britain of my upbringing inclined me to get out of it. I wanted to explore, explore Europe. Paris is where I started in journalism 43 years ago, freelancing. It's where I was freed by another language to reinvent myself. Paris saved me somehow, allowed me to be. It's where I understood the Franco-German decision 
to put behind them repetitive wars and put in their place an iron and steel community that would be the seed of the European Union. It's where I grasped that Europe was a way out of painful national history, a means to reinvention, and that critical support for this remarkable experiment in integration came from a newly formed European power, the United States of America. A posting to Italy taught me how important the anchor of Europe was in preventing that beautiful country, late formed like Germany, from being lost to communism or sliding toward Africa in a deluge of misrule. Europe for Italy was a peace magnet, as it would subsequently be for the countries of Central Europe after their liberation from the Soviet Imperium, and now for the countries of the Balkans. We want to be normal, Adam Mishnik, the great Polish dissident, would tell me in Warsaw, and only the European Union and NATO could secure that normality. For Poland, of course, normality included the assurance of being an independent nation rather than a vassal of Moscow or wiped from the map. Covering the Balkan Wars in the first half of the 1990s, the 100,000 dead, the 2.2 million displaced, Sarajevo's torment, I understood the terrible potency of suppressed history, the moral abdication of the bystander, and the imperative of decency, that word dear to Camus. I saw how to end a war, the illusion that the hour of Europe had come had to give way to the reality of American power, tough diplomacy backed by the credible threat of force. Europe had been divided, it was still brittle. The miracle of the ocean spanning institutions that transformed, stabilized and protected Europe, creating a continent whole and free was never more apparent to me than than in the midst of a European war. Then, a little over 20 years ago, I was assigned to Germany. I went reluctantly. Perhaps for a Jewish family, it's always a complicated decision to choose to live in Germany. I arrived in a Berlin in transformation, a construction site really, a city confronting its history. My German years were a lesson. As a Jew, I had not thought much about German pain the pain of the descendants of the perpetrators, nor about the pain of division, nor about the long journey of the Bundesrepublik toward a full acknowledgement of the crimes of the Third Reich and a full accounting, nor about how Europe, for many post-war Germans, had been a road out of the rubble and out of the shame, nor about America's particular role in that journey, nor about how American values and the rule of law had offered a compass to a shattered nation, nor about the redemptive power for Germany of the blue and gold European flag. Learning about Germany, I learned also about being a Jew. I inverted the mirror. I understood the possibility of conciliation. Contact is a great dispeller of hatred. If only there were more in Israel-Palestine. If I did not end up doing what my uncle and father had done, coming from far away South Africa, to join the war effort for the preservation of freedom. It was because Europe and Germany had been remade, not by some magic wand, but by patient dip diplomacy, patient construction of a new order in which America and Europe were bound, not only by a military alliance, but by a shared commitment to freedom, democracy, human rights, a free press, open societies, the rule of law and individual dignity. How then could the arrival in office of President Trump and the current unraveling and the resurgence across the world of forms of authoritarianism not alarm me, not send me into a state of deep despondency and questioning? After all, it represents a negation of all I believe. Each of us has a journey. I am a Jew of South African descent, raised in Britain, shaped by Europe, an American now. I am a European who looks at America. I am an American who looks at Europe with love in both directions. These are the threads of my story. The threads write these words. I am a bridge, not a wall person. I never look at that blue and gold European flag fluttering on some official building in Europe 
perhaps with a World War I or World War II memorial on the square in front of it, without thinking there but for the grace of God. Helmut Kohl, the German Chancellor, spoke of die Gnade des Späten Geburt, or the gift of late birth. That gift extended beyond the borders of Germany, even as far as the United States. It was not, however, a gift that ever registered at Trump Tower. Europe makes itself in crises, Jean Monnet observed. So what will it make of this one? The 20th century with its archetypal images, Willy Brandt on his knees in the Warsaw Ghetto, Cole and Mitterrand hand in hand at Verdun, Germans flooding across a Berlin Wall, the soon to be extinct Soviet Union had no will to defend, fades. It's Facebook world now. On what foundations in this age of renewed nationalist autocracy and blaring social media can the union reconstitute itself? Well, it must in my view start with peace, economic promise and its values. I confess that in Europe, I did not find cause for despair. The European response to COVID-19 has made more sense than the American, which is perhaps not saying a lot. Science at least is respected in Europe. The handling of the virus has not been dictated by political calculation. The mask wars are limited. It's a useful reality check on American derangement. Trump's provocations and Britain's exit, I think many in Britain are already regretting it, have put an end to complacency. If the union took itself for granted, if it drifted along believing as Jacques Delors said that it was a bicycle that would always keep moving, if it took itself for granted and paid a price, now it knows that it must change. It already has. The Greek crisis has ended up strengthening the European Central Bank. That and the COVID-19 crisis have led Germany to abandon its entrenched policy of austerity. For the first time, Germany has allowed the federalization of European debt. The union can now borrow like a government. This constitutes an important step, a huge step toward a stronger, more integrated Europe. The euro has risen of late for a reason. Germany realized that the EU would collapse without radical measures. Merkel, once again, was equal to the moment. Britain's exit has been a painful loss, but the loss will be felt above all by the people of that sceptered isle now adrift. The United Kingdom may well disunite. Scotland is pro-Europe. I'm not sure that the vital 750 billion euros in aid to confront COVID-19 would have been approved with Britain in the union. This was an illustration how the, of how the forces of integration have been revitalized by recent setbacks and challenges. Something deeper is also at work. The union has a dawning sense that, given the direction of Trump's America, it has special responsibility as the moral leader of the Western democratic world. Merkel and Macron share this conviction. The Franco-German European motor is re-engaged. Without that motor, Europe never goes anywhere. And perhaps, yes, France and Germany, as Conrad suggested, might even be able to engineer more streamlined decision-making in the union. The union must be a driving force when it comes to the incarnation of core Western values of freedom, democracy, openness, and human rights, those from which Trump's United States has abdicated. It must lead the way to a greener world beyond the combustion engine. And I won't go into what the Trump administration has had to say about climate change, the ludicrous things. As long as President Trump, with his fondness for dictators of every stripe, is in the White House, the United States cannot be viewed as the leader of the free world. If you even suggest that today in Europe, the response will be dismissiveness. Whether that mantle can ever be recovered, I don't know, but I doubt it. 
The Union, given military realities, cannot replace the United States, but it can make its voice heard in a new way, and I believe that it will. Already the EU has been more forceful on Russia and China. Its relationship with China until quite recently was purely commercial. Now China, Xi Jinping's expansionist surveillance state, is seen as a systemic rival. The EU has been very crit critical of China's human rights record. It recently imposed sanctions in response to Chinese suppression of protest in Hong Kong. This is part of Macron's push for strategic autonomy. The EU has also taken a clear independent position on the Iran nuclear deal, refusing to bend to various American provocations. Like all developed societies, Europe must also learn the social lessons of the past 15 years. Impunity for the rich, widening inequality, increasing precariousness in the workplace, unease over immigration, were among the factors that led to Orban, Salvini, Le Pen, Trump et al. Europe with its welfare state is better placed to address issues of social injustice than the United States. It must do so. Germany's about turn from austerity will help and must be sustained. Of course, much hinges on what will happen in November. In the event of a Trump victory, Europe's need to go it alone will grow. Trump would without question, boosted by a second victory or some way of contriving his return to the Oval Office, he would continue his concerted campaign against the multilateral system in an attempt to impose in its place the dominion of the powerful. It's clear from various books by officials who work closely with the president that he has had to be restrained, restrained from an urge to take the United States out of NATO. In a second term, attempted restraint from whoever is around him, and they count for less and less, may no longer work. You can be sure that President Putin loses no opportunity to encourage Trump to exit NATO. That is Russia's dream. It's long been its dream, a Europe severed from its military alliance with Washington, and so exponentially more vulnerable to Moscow. All that Russian blah, blah about a single united continent from Lisbon to Vladivostok, that is what lies beneath those words, the determined attempt to sever Europe from the United States. The nature and reason for Trump's infatuation with Putin has been one of the mysteries of this presidency, perhaps the pivotal mystery. The answer to the riddle is to follow the money. The New York Times, my paper, has been doing a good job of that in recent days. Deutsche Bank must have had some sort of guarantee to lend Trump hundreds of millions of dollars when other banks had shied away. One day, one day, the other shoe will drop. I have a sneaking suspicion it will be of Russian manufacture. If Joe Biden wins, the world will look different. He is a convinced Atlanticist. He will restore decency and respect for truth, truth that has been savaged by our current president to American governance. He will not cuddle dictators. He will restore serious diplomacy to its rightful place. But power has shifted to the Pacific in the 21st century. And America's role cannot be what it was. Europe will feel less abandoned with the President Biden, but it has learned a lesson that it will not unlearn. The time has come for a new push toward the United States of Europe, Churchill's praise, as the only way to assure Europe's place in the world in the 21st century. In a few days, on October 3, Germany will mark the 30th anniversary of its unification. Many were fearful when unification occurred. You know the old phrase of the French novelist, François Mauriac, I like Germany so much, I'm glad there are two of them. The skeptics, like Mauriac, were wrong. Germany has gradually assumed an ever more prominent place without creating fear that German power was a danger. To, to the point that a Polish foreign minister, yes, Polish, was moved to say that he feared German power 
less than German inactivity. That too is the Union's achievement. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm not pessimistic about Europe. In fact, I'm much more worried about the United States. The road from here to January 20, 2021 will not be smooth or easy and may even be chaotic and violent. Europe is watching the United States with an anxiety that for decades was directed in the opposite direction. In conclusion, these are hard times. Fear is rampant. Millions have lost their jobs. The virus has taken far too many lives. The European Union was a form of insurance against times like these. It was a brilliant notion. And I think, once again, with highs and lows, with inevitable difficulties, it has stood the test. As I said, diplomacy involves patience. I want to close with a diplomat's words and then a poet's words. The diplomat is Daniel Freed, a great foreign service officer like Barbara. Appalled by Trump's contempt for the State Department, he retired from the foreign service in 2017. Here is what he said on his departure. Few believed that Poland's solidarity movement could win, that the Iron Curtain would come down, that the Baltic states could be free, that the second half, that the second of the 20th century's great evils, communism, could be vanquished without war. But it happened. And the West's great institutions, NATO and the European Union, grew to embrace 100 million liberated Europeans. It was my honor to have done what I could to help. I learned never to underestimate the possibility of change, that values have power, and that time and patience can pay off, especially if you're serious about your objectives. Nothing can be taken for granted, and this great achievement is now under assault by Russia. But what we did in my time is no less honorable. It is for the present generation to defend, and when the time comes, extend freedom in Europe. The poet's words are Rumi's, the 13th century Persian Afghan poet. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if there are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whatever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. You cannot take South Africa out of me or Europe or the Jew or the United States that has been a beacon to my life. Taken cumulatively, I say, even now, even in this difficult hour, that I believe decency will prevail. The construction of a united Europe will be reinvigorated. An American democracy will resist the demons that Europe knows far too well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roger. The questions are coming in, um, but I would like to turn to Conrad because I have a feeling, Conrad, that you would like to um, make a brief statement before we get to the question. Well, I can only thank Roger for such a powerful, convincing, personal and experience-based view. And I agree with you completely. The Europeans have a challenge in front of them. They are, or they have in bits and pieces managed to rise to the occasion. There's always frustration that they're not doing enough, but let us hope that the United States will recover its own leadership role in its own voice. Yes, thank you. Go ahead, Rudy. Thanks for coming back on. 
Yeah, well, thank you very much, Katie, and, um, and also John Stevens from the Center for European Studies. Um, and uh, thanks to my colleague, Ambassador Barbara Stevenson, uh, for her introduction and indeed for her leadership for our global programs. And especially thank you to Conrad Yerosh and to Roger Cohen for a really thoughtful evening. So I just want to um, leave with some thoughts that, that Roger inspired in me with his column from the 4th of September, Fighting the Virus in Trump's Plague. And, um, and I, I'll start this by recalling for all of us that so many of us now end a phone call or a Zoom call with the word, stay safe. And in this column, Roger actually doesn't buy into that. Roger says, stay safe is no guide to a life worth living. And now we've heard he's a journalist and his judgment is probably a little impaired, so maybe we should be <laughs> careful as to where we go with this. But I want to reflect on this idea, this aphorism, um, and our collective interest, uh, those of us who are on this call and listening to you in world affairs, our collective interest in the U.S. role in the world, and especially our collective interest in Europe, what we learn from Europe, and what we achieve in our relationship with Europe, and I want to maybe paraphrase that idea um, to be provocative to say staying safe is no guide to a relationship worth investing in. You know, I grew up, I think, in a generation in which this was the safe relationship. This was the West, this was US and Europe. And the reflex now um, is to return to a safe place, a pre-2016 relationship, say, a return to that relationship of the 1990s and the, that architecture. Or maybe safety is, is merely the US and Europe together stewards of their joint achievements. Um, well, we've already accomplished or maybe a little bit more autonomously a joint recognition for what each of us have accomplished and respect for that. And that's what safety is. But maybe this is not really a guide to a relationship worth investing in. And now we have to figure out is what each of us needs to risk for this relationship. Um, and I think some of this where the other side is perfectly happy to point out what the other side should risk. I think among other things, Europe is asking us to risk perhaps the preeminence of our flagship tech firms for an economy that might actually be truly inclusive and less destructive as we move forward. Um, and, and I think that that would actually become the, the interesting party game to name the things that we need to risk at this point. Um, I, I would add also, we would need to perhaps risk the assumed common ground of the European culture as that which is that unites us. If we let that go, I think we might be in a more interesting and inclusive place as to the kinds of cultures that do unite us. Um, so, again, I feel that um, I, I'm inclined to, in the way I read your work, Roger, and the way this topic matters to me to think about this relationship and, and how we need to move from the safe places of it to those parts where we need to be risking things together to make it stronger. And that's why I really appreciate you ending with Rumi the way you did, because what that to me is, um, is seeing the humanity and taking that risk, seeing the, that uh, it's not all going to go well, but, but in that risk, we really finally achieve what our values are and, and what we're possible, what's possible to us. So thanks again uh, for joining us. Thanks to the European uh, Study Center for, for putting this all together. Thank you very much. <laughs>